Hello. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, we're so glad that you've come to our talk uh, about growing your contributors and keeping your project healthy. So we are planning on answering questions um, at the end. We'll, we'll leave like five minutes for questions. Um, so when you send them to the chat, please include as much context as you can and we will read them off and answer them. So let's get started. I am Kendall Nelson. I have been working in the OpenStack community since 2015. I am currently the technical committee vice chair. I'm involved in the release management team. I do a lot of work on teaching people how to contribute to the project. So I run Upstream Institute, our training um, class, and I work on our contributor guide along with many, many other things in the community. I have also been working in the Kubernetes community since 2019, so much more recently. I am involved in SIG Cloud Provider, specifically Provider OpenStack, and also a little bit in SIG Contributor Experience. I love travel and photography and Harry Potter, as you may be able to see from behind me, and also Doctor Who, so uh, we'll move on now. Guinevere? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I am really uh, glad that you all attended this talk. And I'm really, really sad we are not in Austin right now because uh, for me, KubeCon Austin is where it all started. So as a second career techie, I'm very passionate about making open source contribution possible for people from all walks of life. Um, so for example, I will yell at you to document all the things as if you've never heard of Git before, because you know what? Some very senior folks in tech have never, never used it. Um, I love sharing knowledge. A lot of my favorite command line tricks are things that I've picked up from pair programming or shoulder surfing with someone. Um, you can find me on GitHub by my profile, which actually does have a real owl in it. Let's see. Uh, so without further ado, Welcome to High Tea. We're here to talk about community building. So, and this talk won't be about getting all your questions answered. It's really more about asking yourselves the right kinds of questions. So, when you invite friends over for a hot beverage and tasty baked goods, you have multiple decisions to make, right? For example, what will you serve? Who is invited? How many people are you inviting? Uh, in the same way, you have key questions to answer about your open source community. Let's get into those. Uh, when you host a tea party, you want everyone to have a good time. You want them to leave looking forward to the next party. You need to think about, um, you need to think about sending out invites and planning your features. You need to know how many people to plan for. You know, maybe you want to host a bigger party next time or get together more often. You need to think about uh, who will help you with organizing and documenting. Uh, I mean, decorating. Um, who pays for the event supplies? What kind of space is your party held at? Do you need to rent a building or do you need to get a permit for the park cookout shelter? In open source, all of these are good questions to ask about your community. Let's start by thinking about project health. Um, so this is related to what you want your community to look like. How do you set the table? So for example, how are you organized? How do you make decisions? How do you govern yourselves? What kind of guests do you want? Do you want to have writers, community organizers, coders, testers, and so forth? Um, what are you serving on your table? Do you deliver a lot of features? Do you build new technologies? Do you sell processes? Do you think about, um, do you think about community a lot? Uh, what do you want to talk about, right? Do you use email? Do you chat? Do you have meetings, video? Do you, have agendas where you take notes. Um, and like with any party, is there a dress code? Do you have license agreements, contributor codes of conduct? And a little bit of an uncomfortable thought. How do you discover and address conflict? So, 
So that's a lot of things just to plan a party, right? How do you get some real numbers here? Unfortunately, one of the first things that you need to realize is that it's easier to measure things that don't work than things that do work. That said, uh, there are two types of things to measure, quantitative and qualitative things. Uh, one way to measure things that are qualitative is trying surveys. But let's look at the quantitative things first. Um, there is a lot of things you can look at. Uh, the easiest one is your contributor numbers. How many people are using and contributing to your technologies? How many people want to build extensions to your project? Um, how many people are excited about it and want to organize conferences and workshops? Uh, even more easy, how many lines of code are in your project? Um, Interesting. Uh, sorry, I, I, I just I just got the note. I, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, anyway, uh, all right, very good. Um, let's continue. Um, so uh, let's get back to uh, let's get back to the numbers, right? Um, you can get a lot of contributor activity numbers, such as lines of code. Uh, the length, the direction um, of the project, uh, frequency of releases, right? How many new features do you have in a given period of time? Uh, do people actively find and fix bugs and security issues? How quick is the turnaround on a file bug or code change requests? You can gather stats on this, and these stats may tell you whether you have the capacity for new features, code reviewers, uh, adapting to incoming changes, uh, growing out your project. Uh, adoption numbers is another indicator of the health of a project. How many people have, you know, starred or forked your project on the code hosting platform of your choice? Um, are a lot of these users contributing back upstream? How many questions do you see on Stack Overflow, for example, or GitHub issues? Are they getting answered? Um, how long do contributors stay around? So a lot of these statistics are valuable, but they don't necessarily reflect, uh, they, don't, they don't individually reflect a whole lot of information, right? Large numbers of contributors don't necessarily mean that each contributor has a lot of output or that their changes are valuable and so forth. So that brings us to the next topic. Uh, that was not the correct direction. Oops. Qualitative. Uh, we are going to talk about what your community is like for your contributors. Some of the things I touched on um, are leaking into qualitative statistics around your community health. How accessible is your project to contributors, regardless of level of technical expertise, right? Um, some examples include the a quicker turnaround on an issue or bug. How how easy is that for a new contributor? How do people resolve disagreements? Technical disagreements? Personal disagreements? Uh, how many resources do you dedicate to documentation? Uh, how accessible is your project? Do your events have sign language interpreters? How do screen readers respond to your docs? Do your docs exist in other languages? And Finally, this is really, really important right now. Can you support your maintainers? Um, when things get tough, and that includes the world at large, as in right now, your maintainers need time and rest and other resources to prevent burnout and to deal with other conflicts in their life. your project's health. You want to know what does a healthy community look like? Well, this is also a really difficult question because as we've established already, it's impossible to compare one community to another because you're comparing apples to oranges. So you have to think about all of the individual things that are different from each community. Um, so you have things like different internal structures, how the code is set up, if there are multiple repositories that make up the project, 
uh, different tools. For example, the OpenStack community uses Garrett instead of GitHub, and we use Zool instead of Prow for testing our changes. There are different goals from project to project. It might be um, based on where they are in their life cycle. They could be you know, feature complete and just maintaining at this point, or they could still be getting a lot of new interest. And just because it's maintained and steady doesn't mean that it's dead at this point. Um, there are a lot of differences. You also have differences in schedules, like release schedules, like Gwen mentioned before. Um, there are many, many things that are different, but each difference makes the community unique, just as each tea party or high tea service is very different based on those who are hosting and attending and what kind of tea you're having, all kinds of things like that. Though that said, there are definitely things that should be thought about and are in common in every community. So there's some basics that you can look at, and those are the things that you would want to try to measure and pay attention to. So you have things like a code of conduct. This might be actually written out somewhere and maintained and um, protected by a foundation, but it also might just be implied if it's like a new community that's just getting off the ground and hasn't gotten around to writing it yet. There are, you know, governance processes that looks very different from project to project. There might be working groups or special interest groups. There are probably elections of some sort, maybe, but also maybe not. Um, I, Anyway, there, there's definitely oversight um, in some fashion to help keep the community together and moving forward. Uh, foundations, obviously, are something <laughs> that every project should think about, whether they want to be hosted at a, a foundation. There are more foundations than just the, the CNCF or the Linux Foundation. There's also the Eclipse Foundation and the OpenStack Foundation and the Mozilla Foundation. There are many of them. Um, and your project, your community may not find a fit with any of them, and that's totally fine too. They may not want to be there. The whole point of it is really to have a reason why you choose one foundation over another or not at all. There is also probably a mission statement. You have some unifying purpose that brings you together, something you're working towards. What is the goal? You you probably have that driving your community and uh, it might be written out, it might not be, but it's definitely something that you should think about. There's also community culture. Uh, this is obviously not as uh, clear and concrete always, but are you welcoming? Is it a closed off community? Is it hard to get into? How do you join and participate in this culture? What makes your community fun and draws people in? Every high tea or tea party is going to have something to drink and probably some awesome baked good. Uh, but each one will have people and some sort of theme. And there are definitely basics that you can look at and measure across uh, communities. So the next uh, part of our presentation is talking about growth. Obviously, it's really, really hard to measure a community. Um, but we want to think that we can all grow and there are definitely many, many levels that this growth can happen at. So we spent all this time uh, trying to quantitatively define growth in a community, um, but basically it comes down to a tea party or high tea is affected by everyone that's involved. So me, if I go, I'm the host, I'm going to think about a bunch of different details than like, I hope my attendees will RSVP so I know who's coming. There might be caterers, you might have event staff, all kinds of different things. Um, so without <laughs> further ado, jumping into the, the different levels, me as an individual, what can I do as a part of this community to help it grow? There are both internal and external things that you wanna think about that um, actively and directly address issues and create solutions and the internal things might um, affect people more indirectly. So basically they come down to things happening outside your head or inside your head. Um, so outside your head. Um, sorry, one sec. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, 
outside your head. Yes. Um, so mentoring obviously is very self-explanatory. Uh, you have burnout as a problem in every community, always recognizing signs of burnout in others and reaching out to them, um, making sure that they're OK and they know they can say no to things is really, really important in helping to grow your community. You obviously don't want to lose people. Um, so communication, also very, very important. Thanking others for their work. Um, it makes them feel good, work harder, and you generally feel good for giving compliments. They might even give you a compliment in return. Uh, documentation, also incredibly important in every project, always and forever. You should be documenting everything you do if it's not already. And that is everything from the processes to how you contribute to the actual code itself. If you don't have documented software, how are people going to know how to use it and be interested in getting involved if they give up right away. So everything helps and docs always need more love. Um, you can fill someone's, uh, to relate this back to the tea party scenario, uh, you can fill someone's teacup, you can serve them from like a menu, um, or you could have them go up to a buffet and pick out their own baked goods. There are a lot of different ways to interact. Um, mindset. So basically what you think in your head definitely affects other people. So um, we have the burnout thing again. If you are getting bogged down, you have a lot on your plate. Um, remember that like burnout isn't entirely your fault and it's definitely not your responsibility to like worry about it, like it, it'll happen, but other people should help support you. Um, just remember that you can say no to things when you're feeling overwhelmed, obviously. Um, I am very bad at that personally, but it's a thing I try to remind myself. Um, more importantly, being flexible, open and kind. Open source is very difficult because we work with people from all around the world, all different cultures, backgrounds, upbringings, and if you can be flexible and open, you will be much more successful as a community and as an individual in that community. Um, being proactive rather than reactive about work is incredibly helpful as well. At, um, at a tea party, you can be you know, polite and welcoming and hopefully that helps make the whole event a lot more fun or you could be you know having a bad day and like you're upset and nothing's going your way and like that's probably going to make it much harder for you to get work done um and the the next level is as a community what can communities do and it's back to me um so as a community you need to consider having a dedicated process for tracking and monitoring measurable project health statistics. Uh, some of you have asked questions about this already, and yes, there are many tools for this, and it really kind of depends on your platform how you are going to use those tools. Moreover, um, you need humans to use these tools and to apply them. Some communities have entire governance structures formed around contributor experiences. What that means is uh, you need to establish really strong onboarding and peer mentoring processes. Make it as easy as you can for longstanding community members to mentor newer ones, to take up some of their burden, and make it easy for newcomers to find mentors. Uh, in a company structure, a healthy team has a variety of experience levels, right? Senior staff are encouraged to mentor junior staff. And in an open source environment, the community uh, has the job to make this possible. Um, additionally, make sure that disagreements are heard and resolved. Listen to complaints and definitely protect your contributors from bad behavior. It can happen and it can seriously harm your project. So, Lower the barriers, ensure you have great starting documentation. A key element of that is have a centralized place for people to get started contributing. Uh, consider having onboarding classes and workshops, make them free to attend, 
make them accessible and have them be in multiple locations around the world, not just North America. Um, <laughs> develop peer mentoring and establish a culture of collaboration. In order to bring about a culture of collaboration, you must be approachable. Uh, firmly establish the accepted ways of communication, moderate the communication, look for blind spots, look for challenges that you may never experience, but others might. Do only outgoing, loud, white people get to make decisions? I'm not saying you must be warm, fuzzy, and full of emoji to succeed as a community, although I have my personal preferences. Uh, there is open source communities where you only ever get to know someone's community specific online handle. So what's important though, is that you must let people know the proper etiquette for your particular community. Some specific points to consider, are there language barriers? Are there time zone barriers? Are there cultural differences? Um, recognize internalized racism, internalized misogyny, address those when they come up. Um, deal with the fact that some people are more outgoing and other people are more shy. So how do you keep your contributors contributing? Um, there's only so much for a community uh, to do, right? It can't do this alone. There are some community-driven incentives that will attract contributors. Uh, at a tea party, you may hand out party favors to eager guests. I personally still cherish my Kubernetes contributor patch. Um, if your party is important enough in society, people will be excited just to be on the guest list. Um, your open source tea party may also be a path for early career folks to make connections and write their first lines of code or learn a new skill, but that's not enough. For any of this to work, you need people and their time and expertise. This is where companies come in. They bring experts to the project. If you are a sponsor company, you need to make sure your employees' open source work is prioritized appropriately. Do not ask your employees to do open source work on top of their internal real job duties. They're both real work. If you don't consider this, they'll get burned out and your internal project suffers, your open source tools suffer, and your employee may leave or not be able to work for you for months. Also, consider giving money to foundations, which may be able to see blind spots that you as a company don't do, and they'll be able to have a larger overview of where to apply resources. So lastly, we have foundations. If your community happens to be based at one, what can a foundation do? Well, payment is one option if, that, if the budget allows. Um, recognizing the bigger picture and helping to be that non-biased third party for all of the sponsor companies that exist and all of the different companies that are contributing and all of the individual contributors themselves. Um, you, they uh, are in place to help provide marketing and promote your project if that's what you want from them. They are also there for removing barriers. It's all incredibly important and growth happens at all the levels. So in the end, <laughs> we're all in this together. Hopefully we've given you a lot to think about. I know it's not exactly the most concrete set of actions that some of you may have liked. Um, but remembering that every community is different and health is a hard thing to measure and you can't really compare one to another. Um, keeping those in mind, you can make progress and hopefully throw an awesome high tea or tea party if you choose. Um, no one person should be responsible for everything. Growth happens on all the levels. We succeed together as a community and communities are extremely beautiful. Uh, I love participating in such a global community. It is more than I ever could have asked for out of a job. Um, and along with that beauty, they are fragile. You need to protect them and grow them as much as you can. So um, it looks like we had like two questions come in. We have a 
tiny bit of time, I think maybe. Um, so the, the first question I saw was for measuring community health, what do you think of the chaos project? If you've heard of it, I have heard of it because one of my coworkers actually is on the board for chaos. So um, it's something that we keep in mind. I, I don't have a whole lot of direct involvement with it. I was able to attend one of their events before FOSDEM last year. And I think that the work that they're doing is really good. Uh, it's a very, very complicated uh, like problem to solve, obviously. Gwen, did you have anything to add? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so in, in some ways, it, it also depends on which co-chairing platform you use because each of them have related tools, right? For example, on GitHub, which I'm familiar with, uh, we have the contributor contribution graph. We have uh, statistics on uh, the numbers of contributors, the numbers of the organization members. We have activity stats. Um, that we can really uh, pull down from people's activity on GitHub. Uh, my, my point to this would be that you don't necessarily know the human reasons behind these numbers, and you have to keep track of those too. For example, we had a contributor who just sort of vanished out of the blue, and he was a very prominent contributor and um, in, in the Kubernetes community, and no one knew what had happened. He just kind of disappeared, and later he it turned out that he was in high school and was serving his military service uh, for the better part of a year, and was not really able to get much programming done. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's interesting reasons for why people are contributing or are dropping off. And uh, that's yeah. where you have to interpret the numbers with humans. There is always context behind every single number. I know, um, at least whenever I try to like dig up things and like ask my, uh, the rest of the engineering team for certain things, they're like, oh, well, what do you mean by that? And they like want to drill down to like the exact granularity of why you want this number and what you're going to tell people because it is all so context-based. And I think a lot of times companies try to be like, oh, well, we pushed this many patches or we got this many pull requests merged. Well, that's awesome. I'm really glad that you're contributing, but like just because you're merging those patches, it doesn't mean that those patches are the same as some other companies. Like you have different goals behind how you're contributing and somebody might just be padding their numbers by fixing a bunch of spelling mistakes, which is great. Like we need to fix those, but it's, uh, there's context to everything. Always keep that in mind. Um, so the other question was, um, are there tools to get these numbers? Um, kind of covered that chaos works on that, but each community is different based on the tools that they use. So, yeah. Uh, I think we are out of time. So thank you all for coming and all your excellent questions.